Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the PCF Group PLC Investor yeah. Q&A session. Throughout this recorded meeting, attendees online will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all of the questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And now I'd like to hand you over to Tim Pearson. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to get straight into the quest Q&A with Gary and Caroline this morning. Um, so the first question we've been asked on the on the investment company is, it's, it's not clear if any part of the business is a going concern or whether it will all be sold off. What are the prospects of the, for the non-corporate shareholders to get any payout and when? Okay, thanks, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Um, we should probably introduce Duncan as well. Duncan McDonald, who's our general counsel, uh, is also here keeping a beady eye on us. Um, just in relation to that question, uh, yeah, the question is about non-corporate shareholders. The, the reality is it's all shareholders because all shareholders are, are treated in accordance and will be uh, get a distribution if one happens in, in line with their holdings, whether they be corporate or, or retail. So I think there's three parts to this question. Uh, the going concern element, the will it be sold off and what are the prospects of getting a distribution. Um, in terms of being a, a going concern, the, the bank continues to operate as normal, uh, servicing its current loan um, portfolio and its savings customers and meeting all of its liabilities as they fall due. So in terms of that, the only thing that's changed is that we're no longer originating uh, new lending and we're not accepting new deposits. In terms of will it be sold off, uh, our strategic position is that we want to manage down the business in the most effective and efficient way. And part of that is reducing our cost base in line with that new strategic objective. And part of that, as we've announced, the market is being alive to any other strategic opportunities which may exist. So. Um, we continue to have and will continue to have conversations of a strategic nature with people regarding um, the bank and its assets. And if that's in the best interest of shareholders compared to our current strategic plan, then, of course, we'd give that due consideration. And in terms of the prospects of getting a distribution, um, obviously, everybody's aim is to run the bank down as efficiently as and effectively as possible to generate the greatest possible return to shareholders and in due course whether that be through a strategic transaction or through a runoff if there are surplus funds available then they would be distributed in line with shareholders entitlements um, to be absolutely clear uh, there's no guarantees in life there is no guarantee that there will be a surplus and that will uh, depend on what happens over the next period of time. Uh, our current view is that the bank uh, is solvent and will remain solvent through its runoff process. But we can't give any guarantees. Anything to add to that, Karen? No. Thank you. Um, a question really about how we got here in hindsight, how to end up where we, where we are now. Yes. Um, one for you, Carol. Yeah. So I guess, <clears throat> you know, we, we published an RNS um, stock exchange announcement back in June 21 that, that talked to the events um, the, that led to um, the share suspension uh, in May and the investigation and remediation work that we were completing. Um, since then, we have obviously we've been as we've previously said we've been exploring um, strategic um, opportunities whether that be a business combination or, or raising growth capital because we needed to we needed to grow to uh, exploit economies of scale and return to profitability. Neither of those options have currently come to fruition, and um, so the, we were left really with no option. Um, but to you know, cease lending and move to a, a runoff um, of the bank and exit the UK banking market. 
Um, next one. Could you explain what the benefits of delisting are for shareholders when the company shares are currently trading um, approximately 20 times less than NAB per share? Okay, so I think maybe the way to deal with this is to, to reverse it and say, why do companies, any companies, list in the first place? And um, just conscious, Duncan, we yeah. were told off last time that people could hear the water, so we just need to be careful. Oh, we'll be yeah. careful. Okay, so we'll be careful drinking and pouring. Um, so the, why do companies list in the first place? Well, companies typically list because it's to give investors liquidity and to give uh, an opportunity for businesses to access capital. The situation uh, that PCF is in is that we don't believe that it's in shareholders' best interests to keep the regulatory um, rules that go with being a listed company because we have to comply with them. Effectively, we are regulated by the PRA, the FCA, and we are subject to AIM regulation as well. So three sets of regulation. Um, to simplify that, if we're not subject to AIM regulation, that helps with our cost objectives. And that's really the key driver here. We There are costs associated with being an AIM listed company. And we are in a position where we want to reduce costs wherever possible. And given that access to liquidity and capital is limited it didn't make sense to us to or to the board to remain a listed company um the question actually talks about the benefits of us delisting um for for a retail for a minority shareholder the issue is how can <laughs> i trade the shares and being on a public market obviously those those shares are more uh, easily tradable but the board are very conscious of the interests of minority shareholders and so we are setting up a um, an asset matching trading facility to enable um, shareholders, probably on quarterly intervals, Duncan, is that yeah. the current plan? On quarterly intervals, they will have the opportunity to trade the shares in a, um, through an asset matching um, service. So unlike being in a non-public company where you would be completely reliant on liquidity events to um, realize cash we are putting in a, a mechanism to enable that to happen post delisting subject to supply and demand of course of sellers and buyers thanks Barry. um could you be able to explain the board strategy for the company whilst it withdraws from the uk banking market and after it has completed the withdrawal yeah the, the aim is very very straightforward we want to um wind down the company in the most effective and efficient way we can we've talked about that before key to that is minimizing the costs associated with the wind down once um, the wind down is completed and the completion of the wind down from a banking perspective is when all depositors have been repaid and we have met our uh, any other outstanding liabilities um, the business would then be um, dissolved in the normal way through yeah, a member's voluntary liquidation, I think is the appropriate process. Um, but that would happen once uh, the banking licenses have been surrendered and the appropriate regulatory buffers and um, timescales have been met in, involving that. And I guess to, just to add as part of that strategy, we obviously want to be uh, legally and regulatory compliant throughout that process. Absolutely. Um, what are your current best estimates of the net assets per share? So if we, I guess our last published numbers was were in the interim, 22, so six months to March 22, and the net asset value per share in Mills was 16p, if you do it on a tangible net asset versus 650. Right. Um, next question, um, partly due to history, the business has been weighed down by professional fees and personnel expenses. As the business winds down and simplifies to collection only, how quickly and dr drastically can this be cut? So I guess we, we've kind of already alluded to this and we've already taken steps. Um, we have, um, we've already reduced our cost base significantly, removing the um, um, sales and origination capability from the team. 
um, and, and we will continue to monitor those costs um, as we uh, as we go through the runoff. Um, I think if you know, a large part of the sort of remediation costs are now complete, um, so that kind of professional services spend um, we would expect to come down uh, going forward as well. Um, I, th I think it's just important for people to realise that we are a bank until we're not a bank. And, and so therefore, as we've already said, we need to be legally and regulatory compliant and we have to meet our obligations to our regulators and legally, which plays back into why we delisting, because that's a, a set of obligations which we don't need to um, meet anymore. And therefore, that feeds straight through into cost base. Um, thank you. Um You've described an increase in personnel expenses due to expensive contractors being related to remediation. How much of this factor is related to being listed versus being a deposit taker? I mean, how much does delisting save you? See, I mean, personally, I think I think the difference between being a bank and being listed is not actually that big. If we think about the, the finance, um, position prospects and procedures memo that we updated as part of having the shares readmitted to trading um, in January this year. Then most of what we set out in there in terms of our governance, our controls, you know, you would expect to be in place for a listed business and a bank. Um, that said, you know, there are some specific additional requirements of being listed and there's some specific additional costs of being listed. Um, and whilst in a business as usual or a growth environment, you may consider those as relatively modest. Um, in the context of a runoff and exiting the UK banking market um, for, for PCF, then they become more material. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, that's why we've taken the decision to, um, to seek approval for the delisting. But you know, we've not quantified them explicitly, partly because a lot of it is time that the board and the senior execs um, spend um, in association to the listing. But it's, you know, I'd say it is the low hundreds of thousands, low to mid did single digit hundreds of thousands. It's certainly not millions. I think, I think our direct costs, i.e. not management time, are 300, 300 or thousand plus management time. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, shrinking the cost structure hard closes many avenues for sale of operating assets. Has the board fully embraced the wind down part and necessary wrenching cost reduction as NII shrinks fast? Or are you trying to preserve operating assets structure for sale? Um, okay. And what the rest of that strategy? Okay, so the the board has the board has wrestled for some time with the need to keep the franchise alive, the PCF franchise, which means that we need to be visible in the marketplace. We need to be able to originate new loans and create new assets, and the the the, the costs associated with that, and the need to manage capital on a prudent basis. And so one of the key factors when we were going through the process with Castle Trust was about the, the value of the franchise and keeping that alive. What we've now done is now that we've ceased lending, um, we clearly don't need to have an origination capability. So if, if, if we were to go back into the market today, we would have to rebuild that capability. So it's always a, a, a balancing act, but once you've made the decision that you're going to withdraw from the lending market, then you can't keep the overheads associated with that. So I accept that that does um, hard close those, those areas. <coughs> we have fully embraced the wind down path. I mean, that's the, the, the top and bottom of it. Um, approximately 60 um, colleagues regrettably have left the business over the last four to six weeks. Um, some of them are leaving during the course of December. 
and we are very much adjusting our operating expenses and our colleague base and our skills and expertise in all parts of the business to make sure that it meets the new strategic objective of running the bank off efficiently. Of course, we still have access to the IT, which enables us to originate loans. So that's not decommissioned. We still have access to our um, system of record. That's not decommissioned. We still have access to our savings platforms, obviously. So they're not decommissioned. So the, the, the operating infrastructure to reignite that should an opportunity arise is there, but we would need to recruit um, a new team to do that. So yeah, the question talks about the risks of going into a hard wind down. It's one of those things that once you've committed to do it, you have to do it, you can't half do it. But at the same time, you want to keep as much of your um, operating infrastructure alive at a reasonable cost in case there is a strategic opportunity to leverage it in the future. And we've had a couple of questions come in whilst we've been presenting or doing the Q&A. Um, does the company have a date for the full year results? And sort of on top of that as well, um, do they would they agree that the AIM listing should be retained until those accounts are published? So we've not announced um, a set date yet. Um, at this stage, we are... Um, confident that it will be you know before any um, regulatory deadlines in terms of you know the aim listing and the like um, and then in terms of specifically the the aim listing and the timing of that um, you know the proposal um, and the timeline has gone to shareholders and we seek approval for that as it stands um, at the general meeting next Monday so I think the direct answer to that is by implication that we're holding the meeting next Monday we the, the board is not minded to defer that meeting until after uh, the publication of the accounts um the nab at year end i assume that'll come out that's the, the, in the results as well yes i think given events it's unwise of us to comment on on all the numbers at this stage yeah um are you able to explain the process of winding down um ptf and the effect that might have on nab uh, so, you know, if you could do everything today, then in effect you would deliver your net assets value, um, less any costs you'd have to bear to wind up. But over time, you know, so the loans will run off, um, we'll return deposits um, to servers, and then, and, the, and, and then, you know, those convert to cash over time, and then you deduct from that cash the cost of the cost of the runoff. So, you know, we're not able to do it today, uh, and hence the net asset value will reduce, and effectively it reduces um, the bad costs we incur during the rundown period. Which plays back again to delisting and the need to decommission operating infrastructure that's non-productive because it all plays direct into shareholder distributions, which is effectively now. Um, we've had a question about how you communicate with shareholders um, if they hold shares by a broker, but I guess the question would be broader than that about how you communicate with shareholders. Question 16. So, I mean, we'll still continue to publish our annual report and accounts. Obviously, we still have our website where you know we will we can publish um, information and announcements as we see fit. Um, and also the market matching facility that we're putting in place um, has the ability to add company information and make announcements through through that as well. And plus, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll have our annual general meeting. Yeah. We'll meet our statutory obligations and make announcements outside of that. As appropriate. As appropriate, yeah. Um, so if we've got a sorry, technical question here, I'm not sure we'll be able to have the number to hand if, or able to answer it. Um, using rough numbers of NIM of 6% and a loan book between 200 and 250 million, 
net operating income might be between 12 and 15 million pounds, but overhead costs are now lower than at that level. I don't think we can discuss that. Not currently. No, no. no we, we, can't, we can't discuss that because that plays straight through to uh, audit okay. numbers. All, all I would say is whoever asked the question on the methodology of net interest of uh, NIM, it's not quite as simple as that because it's not a straight transfer of NIM onto assets. There's uh, effective interest rate uh, assessments which impact that. Should be materially correct as a calculation, though, as a rule of thumb. As a rule of thumb, but, but there's more, a little bit more to it than that. As ever, it's never straightforward. <laughs> um, and I think we might just touch answer this question. So communication, given the likelihood of delisting, how will management commit to shareholder communications? Um, given the lost value crystallised, along with the need to maximise shareholder returns as a result of wind down. Yeah, well, I think, we, I think we have covered that. We'll meet yeah. statutory obligations and other announcements as appropriate. And that is all the questions we have. Um, so I'll hand back to you, Jake. Tim, thank you very much. And Gary, Caroline, Duncan as well, thank you very much um, for that. Um, Gary, I will shortly redirect those on the call to provide you their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company. Uh, but perhaps before doing so, if I may just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with. Yeah, thanks very much, Jake. Um, look, I think that as we put in our RNS, uh, it's, it's a disappointing outcome. Uh, that we've reached the situation of, of runoff. Um, having said all of that, uh, we are where we are and we are absolutely committed as demonstrated by the actions we've taken in the last four to eight weeks to um, execute this runoff in the most effective way that we can for shareholders. I know that some uh, shareholders have questioned me directly on this, but I can assure people that uh, in all of our board discussions, the interest of minority shareholders has been very, very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, in the conversations that we had with Castle Trust, that was at the forefront of our minds. And in putting in the asset matching um, facility, it's at the forefront of our minds. So we will do our very best to run off the bank in the most effective and efficient way we can. With an, with an eye on maximising the return for all shareholders. Um, but as we say in the RNS, we remain open to other strategic opportunities and discussions should they arise. And as one of the questioners says, important to that is keeping of, as much of the operating uh, infrastructure of the bank alive um, as long as it's commercially sensible to do so from a cost perspective. So that's the commitment we make to you. Um, yeah, clearly, we regret not being able to talk about a bright, sustainable future for um, PCF, but we found ourselves in a position where the board believe this to be in the best interest of shareholders and we'll, we will now get on and execute against that strategic objective um, efficiently. Gary, that's great. And Caroline, Duncan, Tim as well, thank you once again for updating attendees online uh, this morning. Could I please ask attendees online not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in all that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of PCF Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good morning to you all.